I'm unmuted this time. That's good. <laughs> or I could uh, take up your lead and try and do a sermon in sign language. I notice a few of you are able to follow that, but um, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not as good as Ruth is at that. So <laughs> Let's just come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we've just sung of your greatness and we do want to say tonight that we appreciate that you are a great God and that you are a good God, that you are a loving, merciful, tender God. And we thank you that in the gospel you have reached out to us with your loving kindness. Lord, we just pray that tonight as we look at what is for many of us a very familiar passage words that we may have read a hundred times we pray that we would not simply gloss over it uh, but lord that we would be struck by the truth of the realities that are found in these parables the realities of the way you have reached out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. May our hearts not grow apathetic, but may we be engaged to your word, may we be reached by your word. And for those of us who maybe have not read this so much, maybe we've not even heard it before, may the truth of your message come through loud and clear and that we would be not unbelieving, but believing, and that we would be truly yours. So help us, Lord, in our understanding. Help me, I pray, in preaching. Let me only speak that which is from you, from your word. Uh, let anything that's of me be swept aside and only your word heard. So, Father, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for inviting me to be back with you this evening. Um, you'll notice that Vicky the dog is not on the bed behind me tonight. Uh, she is uh, keeping Ruth warm in front of the log fire, I think. Um, she may make an appearance a little bit later. The dog, that is, not Ruth. She's already there. <laughs> well, Luke 15 um, is just absolutely crammed, packed with uh, gospel truth for us to glean. I've chosen to uh, deal with the whole of the chapter tonight uh, rather than deal with each individual parable, um, but we could equally uh, spend whole messages, whole Bible studies uh, on, the, on each of the parables that are contained uh, within uh, Luke chapter 15. But these three uh, that are there, we just remind ourselves that they are there as a response from Jesus to uh, yet more grumbling from the religious Pharisees of the day. And it's interesting to note right at the beginning what their complaint actually is. Uh, and it's found there for us in verse 2. And uh, it simply says, this man welcomes sinners. Now, I hope that for you and I, as we hear those words, this man uh, welcomes sinners, or uh, in other translations, maybe uh, you might read this man receives sinners, uh, that as we read that, our hearts go, amazing, that's fantastic. Jesus would welcome someone like me into his fold and we can't help but be amazed about that and yet for the pharisees this was actually a complaint this was their grumbling they were saying what a bad thing this was no doubt they'd heard of the tax collectors and the prostitutes uh, and uh, publicans and other sorts of people the uh, kind of undesirables that they may think of uh, that Jesus had been mixing with. <coughs> and yes, Jesus had indeed been mixing with these people and would continue to do so. 
and they decided that that meant, meant that Jesus was undesirable. Well, how much they missed the heart of God in uh, saying it in the way they did, that that was a bad thing for Jesus to have actually done. So Jesus' response to them with their grumbling is to tell these three parables uh, all about something lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost or the prodigal son. The first two are fairly uh, brief and to the point, and the second one uh, is longer and tells uh, a longer story. But each one of these uh, wonderful parables uh, bring us to this same conclusion that, yes, indeed, uh, Jesus does welcome sinners like you and I uh, to himself. And so for those who perhaps uh, this evening are hearing this and thinking, uh, well, this, this Jesus, this uh, Christianity, this gospel message, what's it all about? Uh, perhaps you've never quite understood, but Jesus wants to welcome you to himself. And I can say that to every single person who's listening tonight uh, without uh, fear of contradiction from anything in the scripture that Jesus welcomes you to himself. Jesus would have you come to him. So let's start to look at um, some of what this passage tells us. And we're going to loosely look at each parable in turn. Um, but we're going to look at what kind of emphasis we can glean from, from each one. And the first emphasis that we want to uh, look at tonight is the compassion with which God seeks out the lost sinner. Some time ago, um, the Bible Society ran a quiz marking the 400th year uh, anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. And uh, when they wrote, when they uh, were doing this they wrote a quiz and they put five quotes out and asked whether or not the quote was from Shakespeare or from the Bible. I wonder how we'd all do in that particular quiz if we were asked to name whether or not it was Shakespeare or the Bible. I'm happy to tell you that I got four out of five right not five out of five, but I would like to just justify myself a little bit, if that's allowed, uh, and say that uh, the reason I got one wrong was I just clicked on the wrong button. So really and truly, I did get five right, or at least that's what I would have you all believe anyway this evening. Um, but how about this following phrase? I wonder, it's not a Shakespeare one, but I wonder if you know, is this in the Bible? Or is it not in the Bible? It's a quote that you will have heard, I'm quite sure. You'll have heard uh, people make reference to this quote. And it goes like this. God helps those who help themselves. I'll just repeat that while you just ponder for a moment. Is this a Bible quote or does it come from somewhere else? God helps those who, helps the, who help themselves. I wonder. I wonder if anyone's going to be too embarrassed to try and answer. Well, I can tell you uh, that is not in the Bible. You won't find that anywhere in the scripture. And yet you will find an awful lot of people who really do think that's straight out of the Bible. It sounds to them like, well, maybe that's the kind of thing the Bible would say. And it sounds like that to them because they don't necessarily understand the nature of the appeal that Christ makes to us uh, to come to him. They don't understand the compassion uh, of God. And God doesn't help those who help themselves. He helps those who have no way of helping themselves, because that's true of every one of us. God has reached out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ when we hadn't a thought of him. We've got nothing that we can do to make ourselves come closer to God. There is no works, there is no attitude we can adopt or any such thing which would mean we are helping ourselves in terms of the salvation of ourselves. We are all helpless and God 
has sought to help us through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that wonderful old hymn that we uh, still sing at the FA Cup final, I believe. And uh, the, the hymn is Abide With Me, written by uh, Henry Light. And uh, I, I commend to you looking up the story of how he came to write that. The, the man was, was chronically ill and not long uh, to live. Um, and he knew that as well. But he wrote that hymn, Abide With Me. And the phrase that sticks in my mind from that hymn, above all other lines in that hymn, and there's some great lines, was simply this, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And every one of us is helpless. We are all lost sinners who have no way of helping ourselves. And the parable of the lost sheep is a wonderful picture that the Lord Jesus gives uh, to show just how lost uh, we truly are. Uh, and in the, in the parable, the lost sheep represents the sinner that has gone astray, uh, gone away from God, uh, and thus meaning every single one of us, not, not just one or two people here and there, but all of us that have gone astray. And the man who goes looking for the sheep represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself as he came into the world to save sinners. And uh, as the uh, sheep goes astray, and notice it's very much that the sheep goes astray, it wanders off and does its own thing. It's not been mislaid or misplaced by the shepherd. So Jesus hasn't mislaid any one of us or lost us in that sense, but we have deliberately and willfully walked away uh, from God. And just as that lost sheep was helpless, so we as sinners are utterly helpless to effect any means by which we could be returned to God. Not one of us decided, oh, I know, I'll go back and find out about God. Not one of us decided that without first God having reached out to us and him having done a work of his grace in our hearts. And we are completely and in utterly indebted to and reliant upon his searching us out. I think I told you last time uh, I was preaching for you that I, I once worked on a farm and uh, we had pigs on it. But we also had sheep on it. Uh, for a short time and I came to understand that sheep are the most utterly stupid creatures on the planet they really and truly are they just wander off and get themselves in trouble it's almost like they are computers and somebody has put a line of program or a line of coding in their computer program that says if possible, wander off, get lost and get yourself in trouble. If not possible, refer to the first instruction. Wander off, get lost and get yourself in trouble. And it's just what sheep do. They're, they're absolutely ridiculous animals. Well, when we say that and then remind ourselves that in this parable, we are the sheep, those things may seem a little harsh. But in terms of the things of God, that is absolutely you and I. It's absolutely every one of us and the whole human race. We are hardwired as sinful creatures to wander off and turn our backs upon God. We've each gone our own way. And it's completely at God's instigation that we have even been able to hear and to uh, return to him and be his children it's not because sheep don't just wander back they don't get themselves out of trouble and wander back to the fold they need a shepherd to go out and find them and bring them back and the compassion of God in sending the Lord Jesus Christ is the compassion of a farmer going out to find uh, his sheep he does it lovingly and willingly and this compassion, it's, it's a compelling compassion. It's, it's an embracing compassion. And also the compassion brings great rejoicing as well. Compelling, well, 
the shepherd can't allow himself to rest. The sheep must be found. The sheep is in great peril. He can't just say, oh, I'll go out and look, look tomorrow. I don't know about you. Are, are you the kind of person that if you can put something off tomorrow, you're not going till tomorrow, you're not going to do it today. Or are you the other way around? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, well, this farmer, he couldn't put it off till tomorrow. No, his heart was so compelled that he must seek out and find this sheep and only the shepherd's intervention, nothing else, only the intervention of the shepherd could save the sheep. Even though there are 99 others, this one sheep is still of tremendous worth to the shepherd. Not, there's no sense of, oh, well, I've got 99 others. It's not worth it. I'll just keep hold of the 99. No, his compassion is compelling and he comes to seek out the lost sheep. He longs to find it. And God, through the Lord Jesus, has come seeking out you and I as that lost sheep. And his compassion is embracing. The shepherd, we see, uh, the man in, in the parable, uh, we see, actually places the sheep upon his shoulders. He doesn't find the sheep and say, oh, there you are. I wondered where you got to. Come on, follow me over this way. What we'll, we'll do. Well, come on. No, come on. What, what are you doing? No, it's this way. No, it's not that at all. The shepherd comes to the sheep. And he takes hold of him and he lovingly places him over his shoulders and takes him himself. He is the one who carries the lost sheep, just as Jesus carries the lost sinner. I remember as a teenager being very struck by a very simple thing that somebody once said. And they were talking about how, how people had said to them that, uh, that um, non-Christians had said to this Christian that Jesus was uh, uh, some kind of a crutch. And he'd responded to them that he said, no, no, Jesus is not a crutch. I can't even limp into heaven. Jesus is a stretcher. I can't get there any other way than him there's no help that I can give to myself I need him completely and utterly and the love of God through the Lord Jesus Christ is so great and so embracing that he is the way he doesn't just show us the way he is the way the psalmist prayed in Psalm 28 and verse 9 save your people and bless your inheritance, be their shepherd, and carry them forever. This was a psalm of David, who knew all too well what it was to be a shepherd, and all too well what it was to see a sheep in great distress and in trouble. And he knew that it was the role of the shepherd to rescue the sheep, and to lovingly embrace them, and carry them back to safety. And so he could write that there in Psalm 28. First Peter uh, 2, verses 24 and 25, Peter wrote, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer, of your souls. We're being told that Jesus came and dealt with the, the very danger that we were in. Upon the cross, he came and he ransomed us and rescued us from our own sinfulness, which was effectively like the sheep being stuck in, in, in a crevasse or in amongst some thorns, completely helpless. But he came with his loving embrace and suffered and died upon the cross. By his wounds we've been healed. Uh, we were like the sheep that had gone astray. But now, by his grace, we have been able to return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. But this compassion, with it, there is also uh, a great deal of rejoicing. Now, when I was uh, younger, uh, in our family, I got myself a little bit of a reputation and uh, it was 
kind of mischievous on my part, really. Uh, fancy that, a young lad being mischievous. Mm, can't imagine that any young men that are listening here or any parents of young men or any sisters with brothers. You can't imagine how a young man could get up to mischief, can you? Well, I certainly did. And I, I found that there are two stories that were kind of very similar. One was um, a time when we, as a family, we went on holiday to Bournemouth and we were on the beach. And at this time, I must have been four or five, some, some only young. And um, while we we're on the beach and uh, my, my sisters were older than me and mum and dad were there. Um, so they were all doing some, what I considered to be grown up things. I just wanted to play and explore. Uh, and I looked across to one end of the beach. It looked like it was miles away, to be quite honest. It probably wasn't, but, but you know how everything was a lot bigger when you were smaller, wasn't it? Well, I looked across and there was this fun fair. And I thought, wow, that looks, that looks amazing. That looks far more interesting than what the rest of my family are doing. So I thought, I'll go over to the fun fair. And off I wandered across this very crowded, very busy beach in Bournemouth. I had not got a clue that I would be causing any distress to any of my family whatsoever. So I went to the, to, across to the fun fair, but after a while I decided, you know, it's a bit too far away. I'm, I'm still walking. I'll go back to where my family were. And, you know, I was ever surprised, ever so surprised when I got back to where they were and they all looked rather perplexed. They all looked rather concerned. And dad was, was frustrated. Dad had got his binoculars out, scouring the beach to see where little Neil had gone. Mum was tearing her hair out. My sisters were, were, were sent off on errands to try and find me. I didn't understand uh, the fact that I, I, I'd been lost. But do you know something? They were a bit annoyed at me because I'd been lost and wandered off. Well, I managed to repeat this when I was a little older and uh, on a beach in the south of France with mom and my two sisters. And uh, they were all doing, I mean, by, by this time, my sisters were well into their teens. They were doing what teenage girls love to do and just lie on the beach soaking in the sun. And I thought, this is so boring. Nothing on the planet could be more boring than just lying there in the sun. And as a younger brother, I just had no understanding of my big sisters whatsoever. And so there was mom, two sisters, all lying down on the beach. Well, I looked out to the sea and I saw this rubber dinghy. And this rubber dinghy was getting blown along. There was nobody in it. It was just getting blown along the waves by, by the sea. It wasn't that far out. But I could also see that it was heading towards one of those wave breaks, like a jetty uh, going out to the sea. And I thought to myself, I'm having that. That's mine, because there was nobody there <coughs> upon me. And so I stood up and I disappeared up one end of the beach. And I was heading along the beach and then heading up this stone jetty, looking to where this rubber dinghy was and uh, where it was going to meet with 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 the the uh, wave break and uh, lo and behold somebody else had obviously had the same idea and zoomed past me and went and got to the dinghy before me and I was really miffed about this so I started heading back towards where mom and my two sisters were and as I did so one of my sisters came to me, he said, Neil, where on earth have you been? We all thought you were lost. We, we didn't know where you were. We thought you'd drowned. Where have you been? And I was in trouble again. And as I got back to uh, where mum and my other sister was, uh, yes, I got well and truly ticked off. You wouldn't believe it, would you? All I was thinking was get the dinghy, but I'd managed to develop the ability to wander off and then get told off when I got back. I think most parents that are listening now can probably understand why I got a good telling off. They probably thought, well, I've been reckless. And I had really, hadn't I? I'd been inconsiderate. I was just doing what I thought I ought to do at that moment in time. 
But do you know something in the story that we have of the lost sheep today? We don't find any rebuke or any reprimand from the shepherd for the sheep. No, we see that this man finds his sheep, brings him back, and he wants to rejoice. He is delighted. And he's absolutely uh, overwhelmed with joy and he's saying to other people, rejoice with me. Uh, it was lost and now it's found and it's great joy. And you know something? When one sinner is brought back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no ticking off. There's no, well, it's your, your own daft fault. Well, we'll have you back, but you just be more considerate the next time will you will you just just think about things no there's great joy in heaven we're told of one sinner that repents more than anyone who who uh, wouldn't need to repent and let's face it we all need to repent and Jesus is telling us of this great joy no sense of scolding no sense of now you stay there and behave yourself just great rejoicing at the sinner who is restored to God. Isaiah 53 famously tells us that we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, that's the Lord Jesus, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When any lost sheep is found, there's great rejoicing in heaven because Jesus, as the Pharisees accused him of, welcomes sinners. He receives sinners to himself. There is nothing to from coming to Jesus. There's nothing to fear in responding to his call to us tonight to come and follow him. Maybe we might pray like the psalmist in Psalm 119, and it's not often we refer to a verse 176, is it? But Psalm 119, verse 176, I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. I wonder, is that our prayer tonight? Can we pray and say, Lord God, I have strayed. Seek your servant. And will we willingly respond? And then there's the intensity with which God seeks out the lost sinner yes he seeks with great compassion towards us but also he seeks with a great intensity and to this we come to the parable of the woman who uh, loses uh, one of her 10 silver coins now many say that this is um, uh, probably reference to uh, like an eastern headdress with coins that you may see pictures of uh, Eastern women wearing and and that it may well even have been a, a symbol of engagement and that, and that may well be true uh, but one thing's for certain it was a silver coin it was of great value it was of great value to her and um, we might think of this lady um, as a bit of an airhead uh, is that a phrase that you use in Swansea does anyone do not if you know what an airhead refers to. And can I just say, this can refer to all kinds of different people. I think we can all be airheads at times, uh, but we might think of this lady as an airhead for losing it. And that would be a complete misunderstanding of the, the parable that's uh, being told here. Because God has not mislaid a sinner. He didn't go, oh, whoops, uh, where's Neil gone? No, it's Neil that's gone astray. It's Neil that's wandered off. But what we do find about this lady is that with a great intensity, she light, lights the lamp and she looks throughout the house and she sweeps it. She lifts, lifts the carpet. And as the, as the song, the children's Sunday school remind, song reminds us, under the carpet, down by the door, under the table, all over the floor until she finds it. She finds it, that little piece of silver. And God's desire to bring sinners to himself is an intense desire. He tells us that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that goes to each one of us tonight, that God 
wants us to come to repentance and he is earnestly desiring that we should be found uh, by him. And we can remember that in that headdress, we see something that to the lady, this silver coin was something of great worth. And you and I, as lost sinners, are as great worth to God. Not because of credit in anything of ourselves, but because of his great love for us. It's the love that he has for us, which means we are of great worth. But also notice the diligence. The lady shows great diligence in seeking that coin and show, and so Jesus seeks us out with a determination and an intensity that is unparalleled, unparalleled. How his kindness yet pursues me, the hymn writer wrote, and the kindness of God uh, pursues us. And then thirdly, as we come to the story of the lost son or the prodigal son, I want us to consider the reception with which God receives the lost sinner. Yes, uh, we, when we see that intensity, it's an intense desire that Jesus welcomes sinners with. And now as we come to the reception, let's remind ourselves that yes, he welcomes sinners. The son he was willfully lost. And we've already looked at that in the case of the lost sheep that's that's wandered off. And he gets himself this job of feeding the pigs. He's wandered off. He's wanted the inheritance from his father. And he goes off and he spends it on riotous living. And he gets this job of feeding the pigs. Now, even to the Pharisees who are making this accusation of Jesus that he welcomes sinners, even to them, this is repulsive. Feeding pigs? Nothing could be more unclean or more detestable. This would be the lowest of the low as far as a profession or an occupation was concerned. So Jesus was telling them this man had sunk lower than, it was po than any, anywhere else that it was possible uh, to go. And that's where this man was. But even lower than that, the man wanted to eat the pig's food. Oh, this was repulsive. Now, I've told you before that I worked on the farm where we had pigs. Uh, and one of my jobs was to actually make the pig swill. And the pig swill would be um, sort of second grade potatoes. So ones with bits of rot or bit, gone a bit green in them. Uh, all those would be graded out and saved for the for the pig swill. Uh, but also that it was a poultry farm. Uh, and so all the, the offcuts of meat and, uh, and the waste products from, from the poultry would be included in this. So you've got potato and chicken. And you boil it up for eight hours in this great big, huge tank. And let me tell you, on a cold frosty day when you're boiling up potatoes and chicken and the smell wafts across the farm it doesn't smell revolting it smells wonderful especially when you've been working hard on the farm and it's very cold and this hot meat and potato pie smell comes across to you and it's absolutely gorgeous and then when the farm owner decides that he is going to have some waste food from the local Indian restaurant to put into it, oh, chicken tikka slices. Mmm, what a lovely smell it is. And, and it is, it really is. But, ha but let me tell you, if you go and look into the tank where the food is, you soon realise that the, that the smell is very deceptive because <coughs> it's absolutely horrible stuff. Pig swill is so corrosive. We used to have concrete pig troughs to feed them the pig swill in, and yet it rot, it would rot these concrete pig troughs. Well, this young man who finds himself longing for the food of the pigs, he has sunk lower than any other person could ever go. And the Pharisees uh, were very sure of that. So Jesus was saying, look how far away he's gone from the father 
And Jesus was saying, this is where sinners are. So far away from God in their lostness, in their rebellion against him, in their turning their backs on him. But this young man, we find, becomes ready to confess his own sin. And he realised that he could make no demands upon his father, but only appeal for mercy. He says, I, I know, I'll go back and I'll say to my father, Father, I don't deserve to be treated as so. Make me like one of your servants. He knows there is no rightful claim that he has upon the father's goodness now. But in humility, he decides to reckon himself as a servant. And you and I have no rightful claim upon the goodness of God, upon his grace, upon his mercy. We have no right to say, uh, God, you, you have to do this for me. You have to save me. No, God, in his sovereignty, says, I long to save you. I am willing to save. And the Bible tells us there, Jesus tells us in that parable, that as the young man goes back, while he was still a long way off, the father sees him and notice the eagerness of the father. He runs out to greet him. He doesn't just wait, yeah, come on, all right, open the door. No, he's longing for his son to return to him. And notice that he treats him as his son. The son had said, I'll, I'll go back and ask to be treated as a servant. But no, the father is willing that he be treated uh, as a son once again. And, and he runs to him, he embraces him and he kisses him. What great delight there is in the heart of the father of this errant son who is returning to him. And I love how the King James Bible puts this. Uh, he says that he ran and he fell on his neck and kissed him. Can, can that bring you a great picture? It's not just a you know gentle cuddle. This is an absolute loving embrace. This is the embrace of a parent who desperately longs for the return uh, of the son. A great joy, great eagerness is the reception that the father gives for this son. And so when a sinner returns to God by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, his reception of us is so great. It's willing, it's eager, it's loving. He runs to us, falls upon our necks and kisses us. He lavishes upon us great affection and he receives us with great joy. And he receives us to himself as sons, not as servants, but as sons. Notice that what, what the father does, he tells the servants, bring the robe, bring the best robe and place it on him. You may remember the, the account in the Old Testament of Joseph and his uh, many coloured cloak, his brightly coloured cloak uh, that his father Jacob gave to him. Because it was such a brightly distinguished robe that was placed upon Joseph, Joseph was in effect being told, and everyone else was being told by Jacob, this is the one who, this is my, my beloved son. This is the one whom the inheritance will go to. This is the one that I am conferring upon all my blessing. And so with this son, he receives the best robe. The one that had gone astray was the one receiving this great blessing. And so it is with you and I that we receive this great blessing from God. And, and the metaphor is that God pours his blessing onto our lives. There's no reluctance upon God's part saying, mm, yeah, you were the one that cleared off, weren't you? I'm not sure. I'm gonna, I might give you the second best, but I'm not giving you the best room. No, God willingly receives us and gives to us. Um, this this robe and then he places the ring upon his finger as well uh, and this really uh, the ring upon the finger was the sign of authority uh, we think of it as a signet ring and the, the way they would make a, a, a stamp in a seal upon a wax seal it was a sign of power and authority and so this this um, father does that for the son and God places upon us 
the power and authority of as kings and priests, his kings and his priests in his kingdom, such is the honour which he receives us with. Sometimes we come to, come to God and we rightfully fall on our faces and confess our sins. And it's right that we do that. And yet God treats us as sons. And he confers upon us the blessings of his sons, of sonship of his. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of the living God. And this is what God does in our lives. His reception, as we've said, is lavish and it's bountiful. There is no begrudging and he bestows upon us the tokens of sonship. And uh, he calls upon the whole family of God to rejoice. Do you know, I, I've, I've been in, in church life since a young, being a young person. And I don't think I've ever really seen any more sense of joy and delight in the life of other real believers than when someone else comes back to God. They, they're brought to God through Christ. It brings a great thrill and a great delight. And I trust that for those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, that that's something that you long to see, long to see others coming to know the Saviour and delighting uh, when they do and rejoicing when they do and not taking the position of the older son of, yeah, well, we've seen all this before and, uh, you know, let's remind them of their, of their uh, own inadequacies and failings, but instead rejoicing as the father rejoice over uh, this son who returns. I love the words of a great old hymn by Emma Frances Shuttleworth, uh, Bevan. Uh, and this, this hymn, uh, I'll read the words to you and you know, just, just listen to some of the lines from this hymn. Uh, I, I trust it'll thrill you. No more veil, God bids me enter by the new and living way not in trembling hope I venture, boldly his call I obey. There with him, my God, I meet, God upon the mercy seat. In the robes of spotless whiteness, with the blood of priceless worth, he has gone into that brightness, Christ rejected from the earth. Christ accepted there on high, and in him do I draw nigh. And listen to this line. Oh, the welcome I have found there. God in all his love made known. Oh, the glories that surround there. Those accepted in the sun. Who can tell the, far, the depths of bliss spoken by the father's kiss? What a welcome we find to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these Pharisees, uh, they were overlooking the grace of God that is found in the gospel. And for them to say that Jesus welcomed sinners was an accusation and a grumbling. For us, it should be an invitation. Something that we look at and hear and say that God is calling me to be his through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ has died, my sins are forgiven. Because he has risen from the, again from the dead, I can be guaranteed eternal life. There is nothing greater on offer to any of us. As Alan reminded us this morning, there's nothing greater than the offer that there is of the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ. Each of these accounts here, each of these parables are an invitation to us to join in uh, with great rejoicing and say, thank you, Lord God, for inviting me to be part of your family. So, dear friends, tonight, the invitation is for us to be overwhelmed by God's compassion as the compassion that was shown by the shepherd. It's for us to be drawn by the intensity of God's desire for us 
that he has shown uh, through the story of uh, the woman looking for the coin. And it's for us to be thrilled by the welcome of God that's shown by the father in the account of the prodigal son. Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All of these speak to us of the great love that God has for us lost sinners. He welcomes us. Romans 8 reminds us, uh, sorry, Romans 5 reminds us, verse 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Jesus Christ, we do indeed see that this man welcomes sinners. We're going to uh, sing a closing hymn now, and uh, the hymn that we are going to have up on screen I trust will be I will tell the wonder story of the Christ who died for me and then after that I will will pray thank you whoever's uh, going to be uh, putting that on screen for us <laughs>